So. I'm ready, let's do it. I was an actor in a former life and I was tired of waiting for the phone to ring. <laughs> and a friend said, hey, I'm working on this small film. Do you want to come help? Uh, and so I quit my job, probably not the smartest idea. And I did it. And within two days of being on set, I was like, this is it. This is magical. And honestly, Queen of Glory was the start of my producing career. The wake is tomorrow. Your mother was loved by many people. I know you love my mother. I said a lot of people. So I wrote the film um, because I was really tired of the things that I was seeing that were kind of out there for actors that looked like me. Um, and then I did not intend to star in it or direct it. Then it became clear that like, if we're looking for West African actors who can carry a feature film and get it financed, that pool is incredibly small. So then it was like, okay, well, if it's not gonna make any difference, if we can't get the money one way or the other, I should star in it. And then, as we were talking to a couple of directors, it became very clear that I actually knew what this film was supposed to look like. I think a lot of times I was hearing, um, I don't know, like, a, like a, a very kind of downtrodden, like, you know, dramatic, gritty thing that I wasn't interested in. I think we have plenty of that. And that, that's not my vibe, honestly, as a person. And so I don't think it should be reflected if we're going for authenticity, even though the story is fictional, there should be an emotional truth. And I am not a dark and gritty person. So why would I make a dark and gritty first film? And so um, it became very clear that I actually understood more than I thought I did, more than I gave myself credit for what the film was supposed to be, basically, and that I was able to execute it with a lot of help from my producers creatively and things like that, but um, I knew what the film was supposed to be. I had just moved from Los Angeles to New York, and one of the things I'd always been fascinated about in New York was the culture, like, mashup. And in reading the script, just all the different languages that were spoken, all the different types of people that were sort of like living together, one on top of another, which is such an interesting thing and such a cool thing about New York. London is very similar. Uh, and so that was the thing that really drew me to the story. One of the things that I love about the Bronx, especially the neighborhood where the Christian bookstore is, is that it is almost exactly equal parts black, uh, Latin, and white. So it really is this microcosm of like New York, but also like of America, of this whole melting pot ideal. And so shooting there was, um, it was perfect. When you say the Bronx, outside the Bronx, people are like, oh, the Bronx. But like, it's really this very, um, you know, kind of like lush and diverse and, and wonderful borough that I think gets a little too much shade. That's not warranted. <laughs> Where's the body? She was cremated. Yes, she had a will. Yeah, she had a will. Yes, she has a will. Sarah, you are the owner of the house and the bookstore. There must be some sort of mistake. I'm moving to Ohio. The thing that is, uh, most shocking to people to learn about this film is that it's not autobiographical. Um, if you look at a lot of the directors you know and love, their first films were shot around things that they had access to. So what ended up happening was my family owned a Christian bookstore in the Bronx. So we decided to make a film about a Christian bookstore in the Bronx. Um, I hired a lot of my friends and, uh, and colleagues to act in the film and family members to act in the film. We shot in the Christian bookstore and we could only shoot on Sundays because they were all at church. And there was also a Mexican restaurant next door. Again, like culture smashed one on top of another. That's their big day uh, in the restaurant. And so they would be blaring their music and we were trying to shoot a movie right next door. So it was a constant juggle of going over and begging them to turn the music down if we promised to come eat lunch there with 20 people. It was a daily, every Sunday, that was like the deal. We had to remind them, hey, we're back. We'll come for lunch. Can you please turn it down? So in earlier drafts of the film, I hate to say it, but Sarah had like a new love interest back at home um, when she got back up to the Bronx and, um, and it wasn't working. It wasn't working because really, you have to think about what the message is and it's like, okay, you lose a parent and you find salvation through a man? It's like, that doesn't track, not in 2022. So, um, so we went back to the drawing board and redrafted the script. Um, and one of the things that was really helpful was Pitt's character, which started off kind of small, but then as we, you know, I, I know Miko from other work that he's done and he's got such a great uh, 
funny bone. And he's wonderful and magnetic to watch. And so we teased out the role of Pitt more so. I'm looking for Pitt. I am Pitt. You work here? One of the things about independent filmmaking is that you have to be efficient. And so we just pulled my aunties and said, come on, like, come on, just say these words, you know, say it however you would say it, you know, whatever. And I think that was one of the other things is that because I'm coming at this from an acting perspective, um, it's super helpful working with actors while being an actor, because I know sometimes the words just don't, however they wrote them, they don't quite sound right coming out of your mouth. And it's like, okay, great, how would you say it? You know, and then that usually ends up netting the best performance. We're doing something at a modest budget level, which was a challenge, but ultimately ended up being kind of liberating, was that I had my creative freedom. I got to make the film that I wanted to make. Star, I'm so sorry. Thank you. Well, this looks like a family affair. Mm, no, everyone's just black. I think I wasted a lot of time, early, early career, running around LA with a really expensive script that nobody would make, <laughs> um, banging on doors to get like a hundred million dollars to go tell a story. Um, you know, yes, there is a world in which Steven Spielberg plucks your script out of a pile and you know and goes to make it. That absolutely happens to people. But odds are you do need to start with your clerks, with your medicine for melancholy, with your tiny furniture in order to establish and even learn things. I mean, I have friends who are extremely successful who were shot out of a cannon. And there are some basic things about filmmaking that they don't know because they didn't start from the ground up. And so I think that there's something to be said for climbing up the ladder and using your friends and, and kind of like, uh, working together, like building a cohort and then ascending together rather than waiting from somebody from on high to reach down and, and pick you. What I'd like audience to take away from Queen of Glory, I think, is that while it's very specific, it's universal. And a lot of the themes and things that our characters go through, we all will end up going through at some point in life. And just what community can do for you in a time when you need a little bit of help. The personal is political. I think by sharing our stories, our unique, hyper-specific stories, we actually can appeal to a very large audience um, and share in our common humanity. And then I think the other thing that I really think makes Queen of Glory shine is those moments of levity in dark times. The laughter is kind of how we all get through the really rough times in our life. And I think Queen of Glory is a testament to that. <laughs> I'm very good at being my mom. You don't have to be your mother. You get to define you, mama.